Matthew chapter 10, while you're uh, turning with me in your Bibles this morning, it's a delight to get to be here again. We thank the Lord for Clearwater Christian College. We have, right now, we've had others in time past, but Anita Day and Jordan Wilkins, who are Baptist World Mission missionary kids, who are, I am assuming, both of you sitting in this room this morning, got to spend a little time with them on Tuesday, and we're grateful for this school, for Dr. Stratton, for the leadership here, and for what God's doing in lives. And that's what this is all about, is not only getting an education, but also your heart challenged and prepared and challenged to invest your life for the glory of God. Matthew chapter 9, we took a very brief look at that the other day, where the Lord Jesus Christ looked on the multitudes, He was moved with compassion, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. What a desperate, what a desperate spiritual condition to be wearied out, spiritually exhausted. The word picture is a word picture of those who have been flayed or skinned. Weary. They were, they were uh, because they fainted. And then they were scattered abroad with no shepherd. Is it not amazing that the one who said that they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd is the one who had laid on us wandering sheep the iniquities of us all, Isaiah 53, 6. Is it not amazing that he is the one who would say, I am the door, by me if any man enter in, he shall go in and out and find pa- he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. The compassion of Christ for lost people was real to the point of giving everything in order to provide salvation for lost sinners. He gave us a command, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Lord Jesus Christ obeyed his own command. We do not have it here in Matthew 9, but in Luke chapter 6, you can begin to read verse 12 and following, where he spent an entire night in prayer to God, and after doing that, he called his disciples to himself. I don't know how many there were. A traveling rabbi could have had as many as 100 or 120 Uh, disciples who traveled with him, who listened to him as he taught, who learned from him, who followed him. But he called his disciples, and from them, the Word of God tells us there in Luke 6, or Luke 12, he chose twelve whom he named apostles. And that is a parenthesis between Matthew 9 and Matthew 10. For in Matthew 10 and verse 1, we read, that when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, and then you have them listed there. Peter and Andrew and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Thomas and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. But I want you to notice, young people, that in those verses... Chapter 10 and verse 1, he calls his 12 disciples. Then you have in verse 2, those same 12 are identified as apostles. Disciples became apostles. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower. From those disciples, he chose these 12 apostles, who had at least three critical functions to the Christianity that you and I enjoy today. The early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, for Jesus had promised them that the Spirit of God would bring to their memories those things that He had spoken during His earthly life. It's one of the reasons we don't have any apostles today, despite those who claim the title. Uh, you'd, uh, You'd be rather aged uh, if you were an apostle today. Then we are told, not only that, but Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, when speaking of a local church, to the church at the, of the Ephesians, that you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. They were the ones who gave us the written word of God, and the New Testament is the basis upon which our local churches function today. Then, the third thing, they were the first generation of missionary evangelists who scattered across the world 
with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tradition tells us that Andrew died in Greece. I have been in Albania where Paul preached. He talked about having preached from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, which is modern-day Albania. There is a, an amphitheater there that dates back to the first century where Titus was by tradition martyred. There was certainly, there's certainly the evidence that a Christian church met in that amphitheater. And uh, you get to South India, and I remember the last time I was there, some Indian believers were standing around just in casual conversation, and someone brought up the apostles, how the gospel got to India, and the statement was made, they don't look at it as tradition, they just accept it as fact. Uh, they just simply said, when Thomas was here. They're just, they're just absolutely sure uh, that Thomas is the one who brought the gospel to India. And so those, those apostles scattered across the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, the reason this passage is important, Jesus calls the twelve. He is going to send them after this on their first preaching ministry. His command to them is very restricted here in Matthew chapter 10. Go not in the way of the Gentiles, nor in the way of the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His last command to them will be markedly different. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the last part of the earth. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But here he's sending them out on their first Ministry, And he's sending them uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now turn with me, if you will, please, very quickly to verse 24 and 25. I want you to notice, or verses, uh, I want you to notice how he's challenging them. He's telling them of opposition that will come. He says the disciple, now notice this, he is not challenging them first as apostles in their official role as apostles, he is challenging them as disciples. By the way, just before we read these two verses, the word disciple appears 250 times in your New Testament. Every one of those times is in the four Gospels in the book of Acts. The word does not appear after the book of Acts. However, there is a transition from the word disciple to another word. That cuts like a knife through my heart every time I get a hold of it. For in Acts 11 and verse 26, the Word of God tells us that the disciples were called something. You remember that first in Antioch? The disciples were called what? Say it for me. Christians first in Antioch. When Jesus sets the standard for a disciple, when He is giving us requirements for discipleship, He is telling us what He expects of us as Christians. And He says in verse 24, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, or a devil, how much more shall they call them of his household? He is challenging us to be willing to take a stand, to be willing to pay a price, to be willing to suffer opposition for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because we have been called to full-time Christian service, but because we are disciples, because we are Christians. And with that in mind, I want you to look with me at verses 37 through 39. Will you please? And we're going to lift three great requirements for a disciple out of these passages. And you're going to see that the Lord Jesus tells us that if these things are not true in our lives, we are not worthy of Him. This is basic to the Christian life. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And I want you to see with me very simply, very quickly, this morning, as Jesus commissions these first 12 missionaries, He challenges them 
because they are disciples, because they are Christians, what does the Lord expect of you and me? And young people, if we can settle in our own lives the issues of discipleship, then out of a student body like this, the Lord will call the ones He wants to full-time Christian service. The big issue is first, settling what the Lord Jesus wants from us as believers, as Christians. Notice first of all, verse 37, a disciple loves Christ supremely. Notice that statement again. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, I want want you to stop and I want you to think with me for a moment, first of all. Will you please? What does Jesus mean by this? This is something that ought to bother us. Um, Does the Word of God, does the Word of God say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Does, does Paul still tell Titus to teach, to have the older women teach the younger women to love their own husbands? Is that still in your Bible? Is it still in your Bible, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God giveth you? Is that still in your Bible? Is children obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, still in the Word of God? It's all still there, isn't it? The Son of God is not going to command us as believers to disobey the plain commands of the written Word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is after something far more important than that. And folks, I don't know a better time to preach this on this campus. You you stop and think about it. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And a highly respected and loved faculty couple have just laid a son to rest. I can relate to that. 38 years ago this coming July, my wife and I laid the body of our four-year-old son to rest. A young woman is right now, one of your fellow students, grieving the loss of her mother. Another is with her mother in a very serious physical crisis. Those human relationships are God-ordained. They are God-given. They are to be enjoyed. As you young people will get older and faculty members can tell you, we never escape those bonds. You are going to be your father's son. You are going to be your mother's daughter as long as they live. And there will be responsibilities for aged parents that will come back to you in later years of life. And Jesus is not saying that we abandon those. He is not saying that we, uh, that we set those aside. I have two daughters. One is a pastor's wife up in Baltimore, Dr. Stratton, I think it was a year ago, yeah, just a year ago now, was up there for their high school commencement and spoke uh, in their church. Uh, We had a ball raising daughters. Uh, My oldest girl lives in Raleigh. Her husband is a computer programmer, and they're active in a local church up there. Uh, My my oldest daughter's five feet, 11 inches tall. The youngest one is the short one. She's only five, ten and a half. And they were, they were basketball players, they were volleyball players, won state Christian school championships in Alabama when they were kids. My wife and I had an absolute blast raising kids. Uh, we, we enjoyed the teenage years, we enjoyed the college years, greatly relieved when they got married and somebody else began paying the bills, but other than that, uh, we, were, uh, we, we had an absolute, it was just a delight. Their child raising years were absolutely wonderful years, and I can stand here and tell you, and if they were here, I'd say it in their presence, we didn't have a minute's worth of trouble out of either one of them. We were blessed. We were, and some of you maybe were your parents' problem, but that's, that we won't go there either, okay? But, uh, but we had an absolute blast raising kids. I think oldest one's going to be 39, youngest one's going to be 37 in just a few weeks. I think that the relationship with those girls, their husbands, six grandkids, is deeper and more intimate and stronger now than it was when they were kids growing up. And as I said, 
The growing up years for mom and me were thrilling, wonderful, enjoyable years. Those relationships are God-ordained, they are intimate, they are God-given, and they are for our good and they are enjoyable. And we have responsibilities that come with them. Jesus is not saying, abandon those responsibilities. What the Son of God is saying is this, as much as you love father or mother, as much as you love son or daughter, as deep as those ties are, as intimate as those ties are, your love for me must exceed your love for anyone on the face of this earth. And as much as I love my wife, as much as I loved my parents when they were here, as much as we love our kids, our love for Christ must exceed our love for anyone on the face of this earth. And there are times when we must put our love for Christ above family relationships. I'm only going to give you one illustration of that. I take you to the 1500s. I need to get back in my books and check my date. I think it's 1531 in Zurich. The Reformation is in full bloom. Ulrich Zwingli is the dominant religious figure in the city of Zurich. A reformer preaching justification by faith. Committed, I understand, so to the authority of Scripture that when he preached from the Old Testament, he had a Hebrew Bible in the pulpit. When he preached from the New Testament, he had a Greek Testament in the pulpit. Not too many of us would do that today. Not many preachers could do that today. And there was a group of folks who later became known as Anabaptists who got sold on the authority of Scripture. And as they began to work in the New Testament, they came to a conclusion that though Zwingli was right in preaching the authority of the Bible and right in preaching justification by faith, he hadn't gone far enough. The New Testament taught, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And every time you find it in the book of Acts, you find the gospel being preached, people being saved, following the Lord and believers' baptism, united to a church. Believers' baptism, not infant baptism, regenerate church membership, not bringing infants unsaved in a membership of a church. And George Blaurock and Felix Mons and Hans Grebel baptized each other, and the Anabaptist movement in Switzerland was born there, and it created such a stir that young bachelor, late 20s, early 30s Felix Mons scholar in his own right, was sentenced to be executed for creating such trouble and such threat to the public order. Zwingli would later die on the battlefield. The day that Felix Mons was drowned, he was bound hand and foot, stood in a cart, and led through the city almost on a death parade toward the Lamont River where he would be drowned. They took a stick, bent him over, ran a stick between his elbows and his flexed knees so that he was locked rigid and dumped him into the river to drown. On the way through the city as he was led on that ghastly parade, it was a Saturday morning and people gathered to watch Felix Mon's mother stood in the street, watched her son being led to his death, and called out to him and urged him to be faithful to the Lord. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That brings me to a second truth I want you to see this morning. Not only does a disciple love Christ supremely, but I want you to see with me as well that a disciple follows or, or, or uh, a disciple follows Christ submissively. Notice the 38th verse. Will you please? He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now young people, 
when you and I hear the word cross, when we think of the cross, we've just marked with the rest of the world Easter. We think of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, His death for us, His substitutionary death on Calvary's cross, the wrath of God that was poured out upon Him, the justice and holiness of God that was satisfied on our behalf as He died, the concept of, of a substitution. He was in our place. Forgiveness, justification, redemption, reconciliation to God, sanctification, ultimately our glorification, all of that flows from what Jesus did for us at Calvary. And that's immediately what we think, isn't it, when we think of the cross. Understand that this is spoken three years before the Lord Jesus is going to die. The twelve understood none of that. What they understood was that the Romans executed criminals by crucifixion. I understand that the only Roman citizens who were normally executed by crucifixion were deserting Roman soldiers. Other Romans were done the dignity of beheading when they were sentenced to die. It was non-Romans who were subjected to crucifixion because it was such an abhorrible, it was such a gruesome, such a torturous way of death. And it began always with that scourging. And if any of you have been to Israel and you've been in Pilate's Judgment Hall, you've seen in the basement of that building those stone columns that were left when the basement was carved out of the hill. And the iron manacles in the top of that column where the arms, the hands of the prisoner would be fastened. If I understand it right, he would then be tied probably both at the waist and at the feet to that column. And that Roman lash brought down time after time across his back. Uh, the way the, the lashes were constructed, knots tied in them and bits of bone or metal uh, embedded in those, in those knots. And it literally ripped the flesh from the back, left it hanging like ribbons, began an awful blood flow. And it was the beginning of the death process. Then to brand and humiliate and mark the criminal, he was forced to stretch out his arm. And that cross piece that could weigh anywhere from 70 to up around 120 pounds, the cross piece of the cross was lashed to his arms and he was forced to carry the instrument upon which he would die to the place of his own death. It was a means of branding him. I'm not going to take the time to go into it, but the fixation of the nails severed major nerves and created cramping, and I understand paralysis perhaps even in the hands, and the upper body, bones pulled out of joint, almost impossible to breathe. And sometimes a man could hang on a cross for two or three days before he died. An awful, tortuous way to die. That's what the twelve understood. And the Lord Jesus says, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. The key phrase in that whole verse is follows after me. You see, my friend, the disciples' decision is not, I am willing to die. The disciples' decision is not, I am willing to endure humiliation. The disciples' decision is not, I am willing to suffer whatever torture and pain may be inflicted upon me. The disciples' decision is, I am going to follow Jesus. And if I die old and in bed in the process of following Christ, that's his business. If I die a humiliating, torturous, martyr's death, that is his business. My life is in his control. He is leading. I am following. If his leading leaves me here in the United States of America as a faithful layperson in a local church, that's his business, that's not mine. 
if His leading puts me on a mission field two-thirds of the way or half of the way around this world serving in rather primitive conditions, that is His business. I'm not going in charge of that. I have given my life to Him. There is one purpose in my life to put it in the words of the chorus that I imagine every one of you has sung at one time or another, a chorus that, by the way, comes from the mission field written in Assam, India. And I'm going to do you the favor that our brother did a little while ago and not sing it. But you've all sung it, have you not? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. A disciple loves Christ above all others. A disciple follows Christ submissively. And third, see with me in just the closing moments we have, in verse 39, a disciple serves Christ exclusively. Jesus in almost every one of these passages where he talks about bearing the cross, he actually uttered the words three times that we know of. The Gospel writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, include the accounts five different times. Matthew 10, Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9, Luke 14. You find cross-bearing passages, three separate occasions, five times recorded in the New Testament. Most of the time, the Lord Jesus leaves folks with an out. He that findeth his life will lose it. There's some who are going to say, take my hands off my own life, give up my own dreams, my own aims, my own goals, and follow him wherever he leads. Be willing to suffer and die if need be too hard. And Jesus gives us the great paradox. He that finds his life loses it. He that loses his life finds it. You want joy. You want peace. You want fulfillment. You want reality in life. You want great blessing from God in your life. There's a way to have it. Take your hands off your own life and live for Christ. You want to ruin your life? There's a sure way to do it. Live for yourself. But he puts one great caveat in that little phrase as well, folks. Get a hold of it. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. We Americans, we human beings, can be duped into following most anyone. If you don't believe that, go back to 1932 Germany. And look what happened when 53, millions follow, 53 million Germans followed a madman and set the history of the world on its ear for 70 years. <laughs> you think we can be duped into following anybody? Look at the crowd, publicans or Democrats, running for president in 2008. We can, we, we can get suckered into following almost anyone. The Lord Jesus makes it very clear. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Who are you going to live for? For whom are you going to invest your life? He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. A disciple loves Christ supremely. A disciple follows Christ submissively. A disciple serves Christ exclusively. I challenge you this morning, take your hands off your own life. Determine, Lord Jesus, your will for my life. I am going to follow you. I'm going to love you as the Word of God commands me above all others on this earth. The greatest command God ever gave us is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. What Jesus commanded of us, what Jesus expects of us, is consistent with the theology of the entire Word of God. Love Him above all others. Take your hands off your own life. Give it to Him. Determine to serve Him exclusively. God bless you. Lord, thank you for your Word this morning. 
I pray that by Your Holy Spirit, You would bring conviction to hearts and lives. Lord, challenge young lives. We think of the potential in this place today. And Lord, I ask that in the quiet hours throughout this day, young people will get alone with You and do business with You and say, Dear Lord, my life belongs to You. God, call out some for Your service. Lord, take all of these lives. Use them greatly for Your glory, we pray. And we will thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen.